الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد. I we were talking about the ayat of Surah Al-Isra, 17 and 18, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentioned those who choose the dunya instead of the akhirah, and we looked at what it means and why that is a bad choice. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala then says in the next two ayat of Surah Al-Isra. وَكُلَّنْ نُمِدُّ هَؤُلَاءِ وَهَؤُلَاءِ مِنْ عَطَاءِ رَبِّكَ وَمَا كَانَ عَطَاءِ رَبِّكَ مَحْظُورًا أُنْظُرْ كَيْفَ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْدَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْدٍ وَلَا وَلَا أَخِرَةُ أَكْبَرُ دَرَجَاتٍ وَأَكْبَرُ تَفْضِيلًا الله سبحانه وتعالى said to each of these as well as those haulai wa haula which is people who are obedient and people who are disobedient we bestow from the bounties of your rab and the bounties of your rab are not close to anyone see how we prefer one above another in this world and verily the hereafter will be greater in degrees and greater in preference allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this ayah that as far as the dunya is concerned <coughs> allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to everyone Allah does not give the dunya only to the pious people uh, or and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the dunya to everyone. In one hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and we will see in the ayat of the Quran, which I will bring before you later on, uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just gives the dunya to, the, to disobedient people, but He actually gives a lot of dunya to them. Uh, and this is one of the signs of the uh, punishment of Allah. Not, uh, it's not something to be happy about. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that in one hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if this dunya had any value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not give anything of it to the people who are kufar, the people who deny Allah. They would get absolutely nothing. If the dunya had any value, if the dunya had any value for Allah, Allah would not give the dunya to anyone other than those who were obedient to him. But the dunya has no value for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah when we look at the issue of sunnatullah and khudratullah, we will see what this means and why uh, when we say dunya has no value, what it means. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this dunya and this dunya is there for everybody. And in the dunya also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given some more. Faddallah ba'dahum ala ba'd. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said we have given somebody, some people more wealth and more power and more authority and so on. And some people we have given less. So that's... Uh, part of this dunya but the akhira al akhiratu lil muttaqin the akhira is for the muttaqun the akhira is for the people who believe and there the differentiation will be much more and that is where in the in one hadith of nabi sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam he said that a person will be sitting in jannah on his throne and he will feel a gust of breeze, beautiful perfumed breeze, which he had not felt before. So he will ask the people, he will ask the khuddam, the servants that will be around him, he will say, where is this breeze coming from? And they will say, this breeze is coming from the level of Jannah above yours. So this man will say, that oh, that means that person who's got this level of Jannah above mine must have done some amazing things. Some huge good deeds. They will say no. They will say no. So he said, how is it that he got a level of Jannah above me? He said, because he said Subhanallah once more than you did. <coughs> because he said Subhanallah one time more than you did. And for saying Subhanallah one time more, he gets a level of Jannah above the level of Jannah of these. Both of them are in Jannah, Alhamdulillah. And the least daraja of Jannah is equal to this earth and all that it contains multiplied by ten. Ten times this earth and all that it contains. This is the least, the most minimum level of Jannah which the last person who is taken out of the hellfire will be given. So the person who is already in the hellfire and he will remain in the hellfire and for as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes and there is a whole hadith which is related to that inshallah we will talk about that some other time but 
that is the level that that person will get the lowest level in Jannah which is 10 times the size and value and beauty and everything else of this earth and all that it contains one saying subhanallah once more because one time more because this is the adil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> mentioned a person in this world who he had given a lot of wealth to and as I say over and over again may Allah have mercy on us but we don't learn lessons and that's why the same things are repeated Karun was a person from the people of Musa alayhi salam. He was, uh, he was not uh, among the Qiptiyin. He was not an Egyptian. Uh, he was not from the Qiptiyin. He was from the Bani Israel. But he was a very wealthy man. He was very close to the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he was very wealthy. Now, the time of Musa alayhi salam is roughly 5,000 years ago. Because we are now to 2011, so that's 2,000 years of Isa alayhi salam. And then we have maybe two to 3,000 years before that, Allah knows best. So we're talking about four to 5,000 years ago. If you read the story of Karun, the ayat related to Karun, I'm, I'm going to show them to you just now. If you see these ayat and if you see what was happening at that time, and if we, do, if we did not have the name of Karun there and if you put the name of somebody else, then you could say that these ayat relate to what is happening in our city today. Not even in the world, I mean, even in our own city. Exactly the same things. And may Allah have mercy on us if we don't learn, if we do the same old stupid thing again and again, then how does it benefit anybody? So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying about Karun? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Inna Karuna kana min qawmi Musa fabaga alayhim wa atainahu min al-kunuzi ma inna mafatihahu la tanu'u bil-usbati ulil quwa idh qala lahu qawmuhu la tafrah inna Allah la yuhibbu al-farihin Verily Karun was of Musa alayhi salam's people but he behaved arrogantly towards them and we gave him وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنَ kunuz. Allah said, we gave him of the treasures that of which the keys would have been a burden to a body of strong men. So imagine the quantity of the treasure itself. The treasure houses of, Ka of Karun, the keys to the treasure houses of Karun, it took a whole group of strong men to lift the keys. So imagine what is the actual quantity of those treasures. So what did Karun do? Karun was arrogant. And he rejoiced about all of this in an arrogant manner. And he rejoiced about all of this in a haram manner. So his people, some of, some of those people who were among the knowledgeable people, they said to him, do not rejoice in this way. Verily, Allah does not like people who rejoice with ungratefulness. And they said, وَبْتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ وَلَا تَنْسَى نَصِيبَكْ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَأَحْسِنْ كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ وَلَا تَبْغِي الْفَسَادَ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُفْسِدِينَ and they said to him, they advised him and they said, do not behave with arrogance, do not rejoice in ways with our, which are haram. Do not call Sonu Nigam for a song session for your daughter's wedding and pay 50 lakhs. Do not have a Sangeet ceremony in your daughter's wedding because now that is the latest fashion. Eh? Rejoicing, but rejoicing in ways which are haram which was not permitted. So they're saying to him, they said, do not do this. Do not seek wealth. Do not seek with that wealth which Allah has bestowed on you. They said, seek with that wealth. But seek, instead of doing these things, but seek with that wealth which Allah has bestowed on you, the home of the hereafter. And do not forget your portion of legal enjoyment. There's nothing wrong. We in Islam, it does not say that you must always live in a state of fear and depression. No. 
By all means, be happy, enjoy, rejoice, but do it in ways which are permitted. Do it in ways which are halal. So do not forget your portion of legal enjoyment in this world and do good as Allah has been good to you. And do not seek to do mischief in the land. Verily, Allah does not like the mufsidun, the people who create fasad, the people who create fasad, who commit crimes and sins. So what did Karun say? So he said, Kala, innama utituhu ala ilmin indi. أَوَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَهْلَكَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ مَنْ هُوَ أَشَدُّ مِنْهُ قُوَةِ So Khalun said, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ إِلْمٍ عِنْدِي He said, this has been given to me because of my knowledge. I am a self-made man. Have you heard this term? I am a self-made man. My Kara Sahib. میرے باق کے میرے باق فخیر تھے ان کے پاس کیا تھا مائی کرا جو بھی ہے میرا ہے مائی محنت کرا میری اقل ہے مائی ڈیلز I worked hard my father had nothing he left me nothing I built all this all of this is mine all of this is what all of this is one small piece on the planet earth which is less than one grain of sand on a beach as far as this galaxy is concerned. Forget about the whole of creation. <laughs> Arrogance has no bounds. It's like a dung beetle. Have you ever seen a dung beetle? If you want to go and go and go in the wild, spend time in the forest. A dung beetle collects dung and makes a big ball of dung and then he walks backwards and rolls it into his burrow, into his place where he stores it and he eats this dung. It's like one dung beetle having a conversation with another dung beetle and saying, you know, my ball of dung is bigger than your ball of dung. It's still dung. <laughs> it's still dung. <laughs> and so what if your ball of dung is bigger than my ball of dung? So I tell you, if you, if you understand the Quran, if Allah SWT, may Allah give you and, I, and me basira to see the reality of this world. To see the reality of this world. And we laugh at those people who are, who think they have, <laughs> who, are, who are gloating on the amount of dung that they have collected. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. imagine, eh? We have the Salazar Museum in this city. People go and see the Salazar Museum. What must you do when you go to Salazar Museum? Ibrat, Ibrat. Learn lessons of how not to use wealth. Collection of one man. For what? So that he can give hisab for every single piece that is there. While others steal it and enjoy it and they use it as a museum and so on and so forth. Ask Salar Zang today. If you can talk to Salar Zang, ask him today. What is the value of that collection? May Allah give us sense. When will we learn? When will we learn? We tell people don't rejoice in ways which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. Don't rejoice in ways which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes. What do they tell you? صاحب ہماری بھی تو کوئی حیثیت ہے ہم اپنی حیثیت کے مطابق کم کریں بیٹی کی شادی کرتے ہیں فلک نمہ پیلس میں ایک کروڑ روپے دے رہے ہیں کرا ہے ایک دن کا ہمارے تھوڑے لوگوں کے آنکھا کھل گئے نہیں مانم تھا یہ ایک کروڑ ہے کرا ہے ایک دن کا بولے تو کیا کرتے صاحب ہمارا ہماری حیثیت اللہ حیثیت دیا ہم حیثیت کے مطابق کر رہے ہیں میں بلا تمہاری حیثیت اللہ کے نبی کی حیثیت سے بڑھ گئے تھی تمہاری حیثیت اللہ کے نبی کی حیثیت سے بڑی ہے اللہ کے نبی اپنی بیٹی کی شادی نہیں کرے فلک نمہ پیلس میں your status is higher than the status of the prophet صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم he did not do his the wedding of his daughter in places like that why because was he a fakir was he helpless he could not do it Or was he somebody, if he had wished, he had made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, send me malaika. 
Send me Malaika. It's the wedding of Fatima. Allah light up the trees. Make the streets of Medina paved with gold. Make the hills around Medina of gold and silver and let them shine in the dark. Send me Malaika that they will walk in procession before my daughter in front and behind. Eh? He could not have made this dua. And if he had made this dua, his Rabb would not have given him. Tumari haisiyat hai. Subhanallah. Is this not behavior of Karun? Tell me. The reason I'm saying this is because the same old stupid behavior continues after thousands of years. Is this not the behavior of Karun? Where you insist on celebrating in ways which are haram. And the only reason you do that is because Allah gave you some money. That's the only reason. If Allah had made you a beggar with a bowl in his hand, the beggar also has a daughter. That daughter's wedding would not be in Jawaharlal Palace and it would not be in Falakrima Palace. Just because Allah gave you some money, this is how you use the money. For your daughter's wedding, your son's wedding. And when somebody tells you, don't do this, don't do this, it is haram. Instead, I am not even saying give it in charity. Give it to your own daughter. Give it to your own son. 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 Give it to your own children. No, no, no. Our peace. Our peace. Our wedding, they come and come, they come. Chief Minister must come, this Minister must come, that Minister must come. La hawla wa la khuwata illa bilahe zeh. This is not Karun behavior. And see what happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, so what did Karun say? He said exactly the same thing. Meri haisiyat hai. He said, my status, my position, I'm a self-made man. It's my wealth. I got it, so I flaunt it. Eh? قَالَ إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيْتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عِنْدِي So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? Allah is asking a question. أَوَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَهْلَكَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنَ الْقُرُورِ مَنْ هُوَ أَشَدُّ مِنْهُ قُوَّةِ وَأَكْسَرُ جَمْعَةِ وَلَا يُسْأَلُ عَنْ ذُنُوبِهِمُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ Allah says, so he said, Karun replied, This has been given to me only because of the knowledge that I possess. So Allah is asking a question. Did he not know that Allah destroyed before him generations, men who were stronger than him and who had greater amount of riches? But the mujrimun, the criminals will not be questioned about their sins because Allah knows them and they will be punished without account. How many times have I told you that hisab is only for the halal? There is no hisab for haram. Haram is haram. Haram is straight in the hellfire. There is not even hisab for the haram. And that is why when we go and look <coughs> at monuments and things, think about that. We went to see the... And that's why when you spend time with Ulama, when Malana Salman Sahib was here, he wanted to see some things of Hyderabad. So we took him, Asif Bhai and myself, we took him to see the Qutub Shahi tombs. So after he saw one or two of them, he said, let's go. Because it was also getting time for Zalat al Zohar, so he said, let's go. We were explaining to him, as we were explaining to him, the architectural elements of the tombs and so on. So he said, then he said, let's go. Then he said, tell us something about this kingdom. The Khutub Shahi, Golconda kingdom. You know, Tavernier, the French traveler, has written about Hyderabad at those days. The Khutub Shahi, Hyderabad. He said, I've traveled all over the world. He said, I've never seen a city which had so much wealth and so much splendor. He said, it's a city of palaces. He said, if you walk on the street, you do not see the sun. The streets are shaded by so many trees. 
He said that in Golconda there were carpets, silk Persian carpets. If you walked on the carpet, your foot would sink in the carpet to the level of your ankle. Silk carpets. Golconda had mines in what is now Krishna district. In the bazaar of Golconda, uncut diamonds were sold in heaps by weight. Diamond merchant. They didn't sell them one by one carat. No. They sold diamonds like you sell grain. Told ke, ek kilo hire hona, do kilo hire hona, das kilo hire hona. Uncut diamonds were sold by weight like you sell grain. When Aurangzeb came here for the first time and laid siege because the Mir Jumla, who was the uh, Prime Minister of the King of Golconda, was a thief and he was stealing from the king, so the king uh, kept his family as hostage, so Mir Jumla uh, ran away and he went to Shah Jahan and presented him with Kohinoor. So Shah Jahan sent Aurangzeb to release the family of Mir Jumla. So Aurangzeb was in his twenties. So Aurangzeb came <coughs> and, ca and laid siege to Golconda and he camped in a particular place and I'll tell you the name of that place in a minute. And uh, there was no actual war. The queen mother, she was the queen mother, she was the daughter, she was the princess in three ways, had Bakshi Begum. She came out and there's a whole narration of the splendor of Hayat Bakshi Begum's caravan which came out of Golconda to meet the young prince, Mughal prince who was laying siege to the fort. So Hayat Bakshi Begum came and she was much older than Aurangzeb obviously. Aurangzeb was in his twenties and Hayat Bakshi Begum was older than his mother. And they did a deal and she asked him how much money do you want to go back? So later on Aurangzeb says this himself, Aurangzeb said, I thought of asking for uh, 3 lakh rupees. But Aurangzeb was smart. So Aurangzeb asked him, how much can you give? Hayat Bakshi Begum gave Aurangzeb 3 crore gold coins. Not rupees. 3 crore. 30 million gold coins. They had to be taken in carts. Why am I telling you all the greatness and splendor of Golconda? Because if you think that you hire Falakma Palace for one night and you are a big man, <laughs> what about those whose Traders used to sell diamonds by weight. Bazaar mein. What about them? You think you have money? So the benefit of spending time with Olama is when Salman Sahib said, let's go. And then he asked. He told me, he said, Yaar Sahib, ye kidar gai sab? He said, where are all of them? His peace, his peace, his peace. He had a hair, he had a hair, he had a hair, he had a hair, he had a hair. Where Subhanallah. Hey? Where have they gone? Where have they gone? Somebody asked, there was a mushaira immediately after police action. And there was a shire there who, who took the prize by saying only one share. And it's one of those ashar which cannot be translated. So those of you who don't know Urdu, go learn Urdu. And his share was, Kaise, kaise, aise, vaise ho gaye. Or aise, aise, vaise, kaise, kaise ho gaye. Bas. <laughs> How do you try? There's no translation for this. Uh, just go to Ati or Madala Task. But they Kaise Kaise, I say, why say Hobe? Or I say, why say Kaise Kaise Hobe? Think about it. This is the, the benefit of reading history is that it gives you perspective. 
so that you can then take the right decisions in your life. Point I'm making here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the story of Karun not for entertainment, not so that we can have some more stories to tell, but so we learn from that and at least we don't repeat those mistakes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying very clearly, and Karun said, all I have is because of what I did and my own cleverness and my knowledge and the deals I made and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, does he not know that there were those who had much more than him, but who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed because they were disobedient. So today when we make these statements about our haisiyat and so forth, we must think about that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but the mujrimun will not even be questioned about their jurm. Because Allah knows already what it is. And they will go into the hellfire without even his hap. And then, what did Harun do? Harun did what? Again, same things, same things. You don't buy a car because you need transportation. You, are, you buy a car because you want to show the world who you are. You don't buy a watch to tell the time. You, watch, you buy a watch to tell the world. Huh? So what did Karun do? فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فِي زِينَتِهِ قَالَ الَّذِينَ يُرِيدُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنِيَا يَا لَيْتَ لَنَا مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ قَارُونَ إِنَّهُ لَذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ so he went forth before his people in his pomp and splendor. And those who were desirous of the life of the world, they said, Ah, we wish Allah had given us what he has given Karun. And verily, he is the owner of a great fortune. Right? وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ وَيْلَكُمْ ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَلَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ But those who had been given knowledge, the ulama, the people who had the knowledge of religion, they said, Woe to you! Don't talk like this. Don't say, I wish I had what Karun has. Woe to you! Sawab that Allah gives, the reward of Allah in the hereafter is better for those who believe and do righteous deeds. And this none will attain except those who are patient in following the truth. And then finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what happened to Karun. فَخَصَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ فَخَصَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ الْأَرْضَ فَمَا كَانَ لَهُ مِنْ فِيَةٍ يَنْصُرُونَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُنْتَصِرِينَ Allah said, so we caused the earth to swallow him and his palace. We caused the earth to swallow him and his palace. I was in Florida and we went to uh, visit somebody and in this nice, uh, very beautiful colony, there was one plot of land where there was a huge hole, huge pit. And it didn't look like a man-made pit because, you know, a man-made pit will have some uh, sort of uh, straight lines or whatever. It just looked like... So I said, what's this? This is just they are sinkholes. I said, what's a sinkhole? So a sinkhole is something where the earth suddenly collapses. And it swallows entire buildings. Anything. A sinkhole can appear just like that. It just goes, boom, gone inside. And everything on top is gone in the earth. But the people who do not understand the why and the how, the people who, underst who get stuck with the how, you ask them, what is this? They say, this is a sinkhole. You said, why does it happen? They say, because the earth collapsed. So, all right. so how did it happen? Because the earth collapsed. So excuse me, either you don't know English or I don't know English. I'm asking you two separate questions. <laughs> I'm asking you two different questions. Say so how did it happen? The earth collapsed. All right, fantastic. Maybe there was a stream of water underneath, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. Fine. How? So we are talking about the method. Yes? How did it happen? The earth collapsed. Very nice. Why did it happen? The earth collapsed. Huh? Sorry, I don't accept that. I do not accept that. Because how can the answer be the same to how and why? How means the method. Why is the reason? The method and the reason cannot be the same. 
You get the point I'm making? You invite me home and you make this fantastic, beautiful biryani. So I ask you, how did you make this? So you would give me the whole recipe. You know, you take this pot and you clean it and you get this lovely meat. You go and bite yourself and you have beautiful basmati rice and you put zafran in it and so on and so on. And you make this whole biryani. So fantastic. I know the recipe of how to make this beautiful biryani. How did you do this? This is how I did it. I said, no, why did you take the trouble? Why did you do that? He said, well, you know, <clears throat> you take a pot and you clean the pot and you buy the meat and you buy the... Excuse me, I'm not asking you how to make biryani. I'm asking you why did you take the trouble? Why did you make the biryani? He said, you know what, Chef, you are stupid. I'm, I'm telling you why you're not understanding. He said, boss, but just now you told me the same thing when I asked you how do you make the biryani. You are told. Now you're saying, why did you take the trouble? You tell me the same thing. How is it possible? You get the difference I'm making? What is, the, what is the answer? Why did you make the biryani? Because I love you and I know that you love biryani, therefore I make biryani. How did you make the biryani? This is the way to make biryani. How does a sinkhole happen? By this way, whatever the way is, geological process. Why does a sinkhole happen? What is the answer to the why? of any of these so-called natural phenomena. What is the answer? Bismillahi ta'ala. Bismillahi ta'ala faqat. Who tells the sinkhole to happen in that place under your house? Were there sinkholes happening all over Egypt? Why did the sinkhole happen under the house of, of Qarun when Qarun was in it? Because Bismillah ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach him a lesson and teach a lesson to all of humankind who comes after Qarun till the day of judgment who have the sense to see the lessons and understand and learn the lessons. What happens to those who are given wealth by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who instead of being grateful and thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Oh Allah, I thank you that you did not make me a beggar in the street. I thank you that you made me among those who give and you did not make me among those who have to ask. Eh? Instead of that, what do we do? May Allah protect us. Arrogance. My wealth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if Allah wishes, that is the result of this arrogance. <coughs> that is the result of this arrogance. Make no mistake. In this city, a friend of mine is a builder. He's a relative of mine also. He was building a house. And he called me one day and said, come and see this house. So I went to see it. In Jubilee Hills. <coughs> Huge house, 40,000 square feet. House. In the basement is a huge swimming pool. Temperature controlled. Acres of marble. Every conceivable, you know, kind of goodness that you can imagine. Beautiful staircases, polished teak and works, everything. So I asked him, who does it belong to? He told me so and so. And he says, you know, the strange thing is this man who owns the house, he said he has not stepped into this house. His wife comes and sees and goes and so on. He said, I will only step into the house when the house is completed. I don't want to see the house while it is being built. Right? And then one day he called me and he said, well, you know, I remember the house is, yeah, he said, you know, tomorrow we're handing, handing over the price, uh, handing over the keys. So this man is going to see this beautiful house that he built for the first time. And that night, the man committed suicide and died. That night, the night before he was to be given the keys of this house that he was building, he committed suicide and died. Here in the city. Doesn't take long, my brothers and sisters, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change one condition into another condition. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us khair and to always protect us from evil and protect us from his anger. But do remember that it is necessary to ensure that we do not do the deeds which attract the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he call the ones who do these things? Innal mubaddirina kanu ikhwana shayateen wa kana shaytanu li rabbihi kafura. Allah said, verily, spendthrifts, people who spend money like that, the people who show off, the people who throw money like water, and who spend money in haram, these are the brothers of shaitan. Ikhwan as shayateen. They are the brothers of the shayateen. And verily the shaitan is ever ungrateful and, and, and a kafir. Ungrateful to Allah. I am saying this to you because I know that none of you who are sitting here will hire the Falaknuma Palace or Jawmala Palace for the weddings of your sons and daughters. But I know that many of you will go to those weddings and attend those weddings. Don't fool yourself. Do not fool yourself. By your action, you are supporting haram. By your action, you are supporting haram. Imagine the effect of this. That somebody wants to have this wedding in Falakma Palace and he invites all these people and then in the evening is standing there and nobody turns up. Nobody comes. It won't even go to that extent because when he is inviting itself, anyone who invites, he tells them, no, 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 don't do this, we, sorry, we won't come. We won't come. Have you not heard the stories of places like Chennai and Aurangabad where there is a, the, among the Muslim community, there is a order to say that a wedding party must have only these kinds of food and very simple food. And anyone who breaks that tradition, we will not attend the wedding of that person. And weddings, Alhamdulillah, are done in a simple manner. I'm not talking about rocket science. I'm not talking about things which can't be done. Can be done and can be done here. But what do we have here? We have on the one hand people who insist on flaunting their wealth in haram ways. And on the other hand, we have people who go and participate in that. Who and participate in that. They accept those invitations. They go to those weddings. My driver tells me one day, he said, Zaba, aapi chai, jo nahi jate so. Kai ko bolo, mera bola, oh, to, he, he took the names of so many people. He said, oh, Farhan is up to Shirwani Pen ka, he said, chama kare the. <laughs> Please, jokes apart, do not participate in things that attract the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, it will come on anyone who is there. Don't go and don't say, Mera sir hai, pet hai. No. He says, I will not participate in what you are doing. What you are doing is haram. Don't do it. I am telling you for your own good. I will not come. Two benefits. Two possible benefits of this course of action. Number one, the person himself or herself will get some hidayah inshallah. And they will say, yes, you are right. We should not be doing this. We won't do it. Alhamdulillah. Benefit, possible benefit number two, is they will say, you know, you are a pain in the neck. Sorry, so we, will, we don't want you with us. Alhamdulillah. No problem. We are free from this. But do not participate. Do not go. Refuse to attend. the Even if it is your own relative, even if it's your own brother or sister, do not Go and don't attend those weddings. And don't attend those parties. The ties of family are less important than the tie with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before somebody gives you a fatwa to say, no, no, but you have to maintain the ties of kinship. You don't maintain the ties of kinship at the expense of the tie with Allah, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The tie of kinship comes after the tie with Allah and His Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Refuse to attend. Don't go. Don't eat food in that place. Don't participate in those weddings. And say it very clearly why you are not doing it. Please understand. Don't be among those who Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is mentioning here. And saying, Ikhwanu Shayateen. Surely we don't want to be called the brothers of shaitan, yes? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> talking about risk again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Allahu latifun bi ibadihi yarzuqu man yasha wa huwa alqawiyul aziz man kana yuridu harsa alakhirati nazid lahu fi harsi wa man kana yuridu harsa dunya nutihi minha wa ma lahu fi alakhirati min naseeb Allah said Gracious is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his slaves. He gives sustenance to whom he pleases. And he has the power and he can carry out his will. Allahu latifum bi ibadihi. Now again, problems of translation. Latif is gracious is Allah, yes. But latif also means he is aware of the minutest need of that person. Latifum bi ibadihi. With the smallest, minutest need, Allah is aware of this. يَرْزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاء And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to whom He pleases. وَهُوَ الْقَوِيُّ الْعَزِيزِ I always say, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions His attributes, ask yourself, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning that particular attribute? Why is Allah not saying here, وَهُوَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ Why is He not saying, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ The issue has to do with risk. And the problem with risk is that people sometimes believe Is it possible? Can Allah give? Na'uz billah Na'uz billah The people who understood the Quran, the Sahaba, Rizwanullahi alayhi majmain They used to say that if the earth became steel, iron And if the sky became copper We still would believe that if our Rabb wanted to feed us, he would feed us. These are people who did agriculture, so they are talking in terms of the rain and the earth and so on and so on. You see, if the earth became iron, steel, and if the sky became copper, then we are still not afraid. We are not afraid, we are not anxious, what will happen to us? Because the Rabb who feeds us, he is not bound by the conditions of his own making. So Allah latifum bi ba'dihi yarzuqu man yasha wa huwa al-qawiyul aziz gracious is Allah to his slaves he gives sustenance and he's aware of them and aware of all their needs he gives sustenance to whom he wills and he has power and can carry out his will to any that desire the tilth of the hereafter we give increase in his tilth the one who desires tilth is the uh, is, is the harvest so the one who desires the harvest of the hereafter, we give increase in the harvest. And to the one that desires the harvest of this world, we grant him somewhat thereof. But he has no share in the hereafter. وَمَا لَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِن نَصِيبِ آخرت میں اس کے نصیب میں کچھ نہیں ہے. Yeah, like save us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we that what we see as his bounties on people of this world are from his Mashiach. My brothers and sisters, let's understand this one thing very clearly. We get confused by material wealth. And we say, Allah Huh? Fazal of Allah is translated into in terms of wealth. So and so has got so much property and this and that and cars and what not, what not. Do remember, wealth of this world, whether it is Fazal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not, there is a criterion to understand this. And we'll see the ayat as they come along. But just doing the tamheed building the framework for this to understand the criterion to understand whether material wealth is the fadal of Allah or not what is the criterion? to see whether the person who has the material wealth is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not the wealth of Sulaiman alayhi salam was fadal of Allah the wealth of Fir'aun and Qarun was the itab and azab of Allah. Both had wealth. 
Dawood and Sulaiman salam had wealth and Fir'aun and Shaddad and Haman and Qarun also had wealth. Wealth in ways and quantities that is unimaginable for us today. We can't even count. Both had wealth. So what is the cry? What is the difference? How, which wealth is the father of Allah? The wealth of the Anbiya. The wealth of people who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards with material wealth. Insha'Allah this material wealth is the father of Allah. And insha'Allah this material wealth is a bashara that on the day of judgment also they will be honored. May Allah make us among those who have wealth in this dunya wal akhirah. But if you find that wealth is coming to you, or wealth is coming to a person, and when you look at the life of that person, you find that this person's life is full of disobedience of Allah. There is no salah, there is no zakat, there is no hajj, there is no umrah, there is indulging and haram, there is gambling and there is alcohol and there is all sorts of stuff and there is spending and there is show off then this wealth is a sign of the azab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not hadha min fadli rabbi, which you write on the door of your haram house, after having built it, eh? out of haram income, you put hadha min fadli rabbi, to takti to. People who are getting wealth while they are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a sign of the adab of Allah. And we look at the ayat, I am not speaking without proof, I will give you the dalail for this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that what we see as his bounties on people of this world are from his mashia. These are not the results of the efforts of those people and they are a test and sometimes a source of great loss. Allah also warns those of us who hanker after this life that if He were to increase our provision, we would become rebellious. And subhanAllah, really I tell you, sometimes you think about this. Many people today in this world are indulging in haram for only one reason, because they have money. If they didn't have the money, they wouldn't be able to do it. They would not be able to do it if they didn't have the money. How do these young people go and sit in, 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 the, in the coffee shops and spend I don't know how much doing all sorts of stuff? Why? Because they have money. Money can be a source of goodness or it can be a source of great adab. And also do remember that most of the time it is a source of adab. The number of people who have wealth and who are still on the straight path is very small. Make no mistake and don't think, no, no, but I will be that one. Ah. The number of people who have wealth and that wealth takes them down the drain, huge number of people. Huge number of people. Wealth and fame are two things that have the maximum power to take you down the wrong path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the evil of both. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Allah actually does not increase our rizq because if He increased our rizq, we would become rebellious. So a shortening of provision is actually a sign of the mercy of Allah in order that we may be protected from the punishment of transgression. Now obviously we don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to restrict our provision, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us plenty with khair and halal and to keep us on the khair. But when we are faced with difficulties, we don't complain, we turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His mercy and we act with sabr and shukr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَوْ بَسَطَ اللَّهُ الرِّزْقَ لِعْبَادِهِ لَبَغَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ يُنَزِّلُ بِقَدَرٍ مَا يَشَاءُ إِنَّهُ بِعْبَادِهِ خَبِيرٌ بَصِيرٌ Allah said, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to enlarge the provision of his slaves, they would surely rebel in the earth. لَبَغَوْ The lamb is the lamb of ta'kid. Verily they will do بَغَوَتْ لَبَغَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ 
Surely they will rebel in the earth. But he sends down by measure as he wills. Verily he is in respect of his slaves, well aware and, the, and sees all, all seer of things that benefit. Shaitan frightens us with poverty, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforts us with his power. Question is, who do we believe? I'm seriously asking myself this question, I'm asking you to ask yourself this question. Who do you believe, Allah or Shaitan? We have to ask this question. As no use saying, no, 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 but you know, I am Muslim. No, no, no. If all Muslims believed the promises of Allah, all the evil would disappear from the earth. So who do we believe? Do we believe Allah or do you believe Shaitan? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not to be misled by Shaitan into believing that we earn by our effort and that if we did not do forbidden things like dealing in riba and so on we would become poor. This is what Shaitan tells you. And may Allah protect us there are people who also give these fatawa they give the fatwa to say that although the hadith of Rabbi Sallallahu Alaihi is very clear, he said that one dirham, one dinar of haram in 100 dinar of halal, which means 99 is halal, one haram in it makes the whole hundred haram. But we have people who are giving fatwa today to say that up to 15% of haram income is permitted. Now you ask them, where did you get the 15% from? Where did you get the 15% from? So if I have 14% of haram income, this is fine. But if I have 16%, it is wrong, is it? Because you are giving the 15 magic number, no? 15% is jayas. So if I have 14, <laughs> huh? if I have 14, it's fine. But if I have 16%, it is haram. So I asked them, I said, I've got a glass of water, I put 15% of urine, will you drink it? People object and don't give dirty examples. Dirty examples are the ones that stick. You know, George Bernard Shaw said there's no point in saying something which does not get people upset. Because the only time people act is if they are upset. So he says if you are speaking and people are not getting upset, there's something wrong. <laughs> Seriously ask yourself this question. And then there is this great mistaken impression that people have. Where they come and tell you, if you tell them, boss, you know what you're doing is wrong. No, no, pas fatwa hai. And they will tell you the name of so and so. I have a fatwa of so and so. Please understand very clearly. You know what is a fatwa? A fatwa is a legal opinion. It is not a ruling. It's not a ruling. The law does not change because of a fatwa. It's like going to a tax lawyer and saying, am I liable to pay income tax? And the tax lawyer says, no, no, no need to pay income tax. So you don't pay income tax. Then after five years, you get a raid on your house and they cut away everything, including yourself and your jewelry and whatnot, and the income tax department puts a fine of 50 million on you. So you take your lawyer's fatwa and you say, you know what, my lawyer told me I need not pay income tax. So the income tax department, what will they do? They laugh in your face and they say, you are a fool, your lawyer is a bigger fool. Law does not change because your lawyer misinterpreted the law. He didn't understand the law, gave you a wrong opinion. Law does not change. You are liable for tax, so now shell out the money or go sit in jail. So how does this fatwa that you have got to say that 15% of haram is jais, how does it change the law? of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which says that even one drop is not jayas because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and Allah does not accept anything which is, un is, which is impure how does the fatwa of your compliant alim change the word of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you want to fool yourself, fool yourself doesn't change reality my brothers and sisters does not change reality so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here do not be misled by shaitan into believing that we earn by our effort and that if we did not do forbidden things we would become poor. Allah on the contrary promises forgiveness and his bounty. The question I'm saying is it is for us to ask ourselves whose promise do we believe? Allah's promise or shaitan's promise? 
Allah also tells us that shaitan has no power over those who have iman and believe in Allah and ask for his protection from shaitan. Allah says, "Ash-shaytanu yaidukum al-faqra wa ya'murukum bil-fahsha wallahu yaidukum maghfira wallahu yaidukum maghfiratan minhu wa fadlan wallahu wasi'un alim." Shaitan threatens you with poverty and orders you to commit fahsha, shameful deeds. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises you forgiveness from himself and his bounty. And Allah is all sufficient for his creature's needs and he knows all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَفْزِزْ مَنِ اسْتَتَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكَ وَأَجْلِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِخَيْلِكَ وَرَجِلِكَ وَشَارِكُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَعِدْهُمْ وَمَا يَعِدُهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا Allah says the shaitan and istafziz Allah is saying to the shaitan go and fool them gradually those whom you can fool among them with your voice the mufassirin have said very clearly this sawtil shaitan they have done this tafsir of, of, the, of the tafsir and they have said that it refers to songs and music. And Allah says, وَأَجْلِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِخَيْلِكَ وَرَجِلِكَ And assault them with your cavalry and your infantry. Mutually share with them wealth and children by tempting them to earn money in illegal ways. And make promises to them. But shaitan promises them nothing but deceit. Shaitan will promise all of this. Shaitan will promise all of this. But the promise of Shaitan is deceit. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْتَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ فَلَا تَخَافُهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah says it is only Shaitan who suggests to you the fear of his awliya. The friends of shaitan. So don't fear them, but fear me if you are true believers. Fear, don't fear them. Fear me if you are true believers. People will tell you, Zaab, ab aisa nahi karo, toh kaisa, loga kya samjhenge? Samajh le, ab kya karna hai us? Aur koi kuch ne samajhta. This is another big fallacy. Big fallacy. First of all, it doesn't matter. Secondly, even if it mattered, we, we, we think people are you know, concerned enough to really think and have opinions about you. They're not. They don't care. They have their own lives to lead. It's all from shaitan leading us into ways which are destructive for us. So what should you do? Ask the refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِمَّا يَنزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ Allah said, and if an evil whisper, if a waswasa comes to you from shaitan, then ask the protection of Allah. Verily, He is the all-hearer, all-knower. Verily, those who are al-muttaqoon, people who have taqwa, when an evil thought comes to them from shaitan, they remember Allah and indeed they then see correctly. If a thought comes from shaitan, then you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide inshallah. And that's the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan is the one who deceives and the one who deserts. Now Allah said, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا خُدِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ مَا أَنَا بِمُسْرِخِيكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِخِي 
in Surah Ibrahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned what the shaitan will say and the shaitan will say when the matter has been decided on the day of judgment when the jahannam has been decreed for the people who obeyed shaitan the shaitan will say, will say to them verily Allah promised you a promise of truth and I too promised you but I betrayed you I had no authority over you except that I called you and tempted you and you responded to me so blame me not don't curse me curse yourself don't blame me blame yourself I cannot help you nor can you help me I deny your former acts in associating me as a partner with Allah now you might say I'm not associating shaitan with Allah but if you are obeying the shaitan then you are committing shirk and you are joining the shaitan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes in surah al-furqan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this very clearly where he said the people who follow their hawa they are committing shirk they have made their desire into their ma'bud And verily there is a pa painful torment for the Zalimun. The shaitan will say this, deserter. He will come and whisper and you follow him and then he washes his hands clean and he says, I have nothing to do with you. Whatever you did is on your head. Yes? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this, this issue of joining our desires and doing shirk because we worship our desires. أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَا أَفَأَنْتَ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَكِيلًا In Surah Al-Furqan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, have you not seen those who have made إِلَاهَهُ هَوَا who have made their own desires their ilah, their ma'bud who have made their desires the object of their worship they worship their desires instead of worshipping Allah what is the meaning of that? I have a desire to do something which is haram but I do this haram even though I know it is haram so who am I worshipping now? the desire أَفَأَنْتَ تَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَكِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are you going to intercede for these people? are you going to be the wakil for these people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibiting his Nabi from interceding for such people. He's prohibiting his Nabi from asking forgiveness for such people. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Think about this. Before you spend your money in doing things which are haram. And if you want to know what is the cost of that, bring that bill to me and I'll, I'll add up the cost and tell you. The cost is not that one crore. The cost is much more than that. Add it up. The shaitan cannot harm us. Let us be very clear about this. The shaitan has no authority over us. Innama najwa mina shaitani liyahazuna alladhina amanu wa laysa bidharrihim shay'an illa bi idhnillah wa ala allahi fal yatawakkalil mu'minun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that conspiracies are only from shaitan in order that he may cause grief to the believers but he cannot harm them in the least except as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits and in Allah let the believers put their trust Harm and benefit comes only from Allah. Right? Now if you think about this, when we are saying harm, except we hear Allah SWT is saying the shaitan cannot harm the believers and no harm can come to them except what Allah wills. Now you might say, well why does Allah want to harm me? Allah does not want to harm us at all. When we are saying harm, what we mean is that what appears to be harm, but actually this is the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, we all make dua and Rasulullah said the one who does not make dua for shahada with ikhlas has died without iman. Died without iman. To make dua for to die as a shaheed fi sabilillah is part of iman. And it's, Allah, it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he wants to give us this. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us this in the best way that is in keeping with what he likes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala person may die in his bed but Allah may give him the reward and daraja of being shahid fi sabil Allah alam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give but the story of the sahaba Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam some people came and they asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they said a man a delegation came from one of the big tribes 
and the leader of the delegation the man was a was a cook and he was deceiving so he came and he uh, with his delegation and he said to Muhammad sallallahu he said please send us a group of your uh, your qurra your people who know the quran the hufaz and the qari of the quran because we want them to teach the quran to our people so rasulullah sallallahu sent a group of qurra under the leadership of one of them and uh, these uh, hufaz of quran the sahaba they went with these people now when they reached their tribe uh, the real purpose came forth and uh, this man got all of them arrested and eventually they killed all of them but the leader of them was talking to this man and while he was talking to this man this man signaled to one of his uh, people and that man from behind he speared this sahabi right through his chest so he hit him in the chest in the back and the spear came out of his chest and this sahabi when the when that happened when the spear hit him and came out of his chest he said fustu bi rabbil kaaba he said i have succeeded by the rub of the kaaba and he died he said fustu bi rabbil kaaba eh? now the man who killed him he was so affected by what he said that he went and asked people he said what does he mean fustu bi rabbil kaaba how did he succeed I just killed him. He said, I just killed him. He died. He says, first to be Rabbil Ka. How did he succeed? How did he succeed? They said, because he has attained Shahada fi Sabilillah. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with him. Allah gives him Jannah. He has succeeded. The man was so affected by this that he became Muslim. And when this was reported, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "See the the, the 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 mercy of Allah. The one who killed and the one who was killed both get Jannah." Ajib, eh? he met Tawbah and he became Muslim. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Said, see the mercy of Allah. The one who killed and the one who got killed both became." The reason I'm explaining this to you is that on the face of it, what happens might look like harm so and so was killed harm so and so's family was destroyed harm and it could not have happened unless Allah willed without the will of Allah it cannot happen but we have to see behind this the circle behind the surface if that person died in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is not harm it is the greatest goodness that can exist because one day we die anyway one day we die anyway whether we live in obedience to Allah or whether we live in disobedience to Allah one day we die all of us no matter how much power we had no matter how much wealth we had no matter how powerless we were no matter how poor we were no matter this or that one day we all die the question is what happens after that and if our life and our death was spent in the path of Allah in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of which when we die we get Jannatul Firdausul Ala bi ghayri hisab there is nothing that can compare with that and on the contrary if we lived in this world in great pomp and splendor in great comfort and we died in that state in the disobedience of Allah as a result of which we end up in the wrong place on the day of judgment then all of this pomp and splendor and so on will not be worth the wing of a mosquito nothing absolutely no worth I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it possible and easy for us to obey him and to live a life of obedience and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us shahada fi sabilihi 
to give us shahada in his path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to lead a life that is a source of blessing for us in dunya as well as the akhirah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and our families. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and our families, those who have gone before and those who are to come and to ensure that we live our lives not only as obedient slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our lives a source of guidance for others who come into contact with us so that we spread goodness around us wherever we might be wa sallallahu ala nabiyil kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin we will continue our class again inshallah next Saturday at the same time uh, which is 5 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday and we will do the rest of of the uh, lectures on risk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.